Drew Skills, are you on the line with me? Oh, I am here, brother. I am ready for a fun night. Zane Paisley, are you with us, brother? I am so excited. We got the show is uh, evolving, and uh, it's it's going to be a whole lot of fun tonight. You know, I'm really excited about our guests that are coming on in a little while. But right now, I want to talk about a couple topical things that have happened in wrestling last week. And Zane, I think you have a, a firm grip on the pulse of what this is. So I'm going to let you bring up the topics, and uh, Drew Skills and I will get on it. Excellent. Um, well, the the biggest thing to me this past week was a fan dressed uh, as a Shield member jumped in the ring at Night of Champions uh, while the Wyatt family were in there and um, Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose were in there. This is the third or fourth time in, in the last month that something has happened with Shield members. Uh, there was the incident, which we talked with Rosie about this, and we also talked to uh, uh, Sika about this about uh, Roman Reigns getting a Money in the Bank uh, briefcase uh, thrown at him and hit him in the head. And then uh, the next uh, next couple days, Dean Ambrose, someone had jumped the rail in, in Puerto Rico and uh, looked like they were about to attack Dean Ambrose, and security got him right before that happened. And then uh, just a few weeks ago on Raw, someone jumped the rail and, walked down to the ring with uh, um, the WWE champion Seth Rollins. So this is uh, an epidemic, I would say. Now, the latest news that came out today is that WWE has prosecuted this gentleman. He's going to be uh, serving 10 days in uh, jail for jumping in the ring, basically trespassing. Uh, I know that you guys will have a lot of insight into this, so I wanted to get your opinions on... What do you think? Uh, obviously, there's differences of what they used to do to fans that, that hop the barrier versus what they do now. And what can WWE uh, do to stem this from uh, occurring again? Well, I'll grab this first if it's okay, and then I'll hand it over to Drew. Uh, you know, so, it, it, it's, a, it's a recipe for disaster. And I speak from experience. In 1996, I was on my way to the ring for um, – MEWF, which was the Mid-Atlantic Wrestling Federation in Baltimore, Maryland, ran out of Dundalk in the Union Hall. And as I'm going to the ring in a ring jacket, I see a fan swing something sharp at me. I put my right arm up. I go in the ring. I take off my jacket. The other guy that I was wrestling tells the ref, cue ball's cut really bad under his arm. And a guy with a box, a guy with a box cutter tried to cut my throat. And thank God I put my arm up and cut the inside of my arm uh, instead of my bicep about an inch deep. Versus the fact that he would have cut my throat, and uh, you know another instance in in, uh, in North Carolina at Cape Hatteras, an outdoor show, I had a fan jump in. I had Chris Stevenson in a camel clutch. Fan jumped in and punched me in the head with a roll of dimes in his hand. So you know, I I speak from experience. This is dangerous. It cannot happen. Security must be increased. I understand that WWE is prosecuting this man to full extent of the law to set an example for other people. We just had the shooting at the Performance Center. I mean, this really is getting legs and getting out of control on its own. And if they don't get a hold of it and stop it right away, I'm predicting something really horrific is going to happen. Drew? Yeah, I completely agree, brother. I uh, had a a similar instance we talked about uh, on the show before with Zane where I was uh, attacked by a fan and hit with a hammer. And I think, uh, you know, kind of like we talked about before, it's the fans have to understand or, you know, a lot of differences in how it was handled before, back in the day, to handle how it's handled now. And I think once the fans see that there is repercussions, I think it'll die off. Uh, I think it was, you know, one of those things where people would see it happen and the guy just disappears and you don't hear anything about it and they, they, they take their chances. Well, you know, I think that's almost the correct thing because if you give this press, all you do is encourage others to do the same thing. So I think you got to kind of downplay this. You got to go with we're going to prosecute him to the fullest extent of the law, and you got to almost squelch it right away, and you got to increase security so that it cannot happen again. I mean, that's what's crucial. You have to protect the wrestlers, you know. And believe it or not, and I know people think we're tough guys, and we are for the most part, but you know, when we're coming to the ring, we're fairly vulnerable to whatever happens to us. So that's a time when we need to be protected. We have our backs as we walk by to literally hundreds, if not thousands, of fans. So we're in a very precarious position. We must be protected, and they must send a message to other people. 
yet without glorifying what these people have done so that others will try to do it. It's a very fine line to handle this, in my opinion. I totally agree. It's a, it's a line that you have to walk uh, with, you know, also uh, putting off the fans as far as the contact. The fans love to, you know, reach out and, and on that ramp and, and touch the wrestler. So it's a fine line, but it has to be addressed. Safety is, is paramount. I agree. What do you think, Zane? Well, uh, you know, I was thinking about this today, and I remember back in the WCW days, they used to have a lot of this happen where fans would jump in the ring. And uh, I actually looked up a video. Mark Curtis, uh, are you guys familiar with him? Oh, yeah, a friend of his. Yeah, uh, he, uh, very small guy. Uh, I believe that he trained to be a wrestler, but he was just too small, so he went into refereeing. Yeah. And uh, a fan jumped in during a match live on Nitro. He grabbed the guy, put him in some kind of chokehold until security could grab him and, and take him away. I, you know, I'm not saying that the wrestlers should beat up the fans because, you know, that's that opens themselves up for liability. But, you know, I think that if somebody left the ring with a bloody nose, I think that that would stop it for a while. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully this uh, 10 days in jail that this uh, Joker is getting uh, will deter some people. But I think a little bit of color will go a long way, too. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, if you if you watch, you know, there's a history of fans running out on football fields or baseball fields. And, and as sad as it is, the more violent the treatment was, whether being tackled by a player or a uh, security or a police officer, it seemed to shut it down pretty quick. And I think that's an important thing. And, you know, in, in the wrestling business, and, and this is something from a lit- litigation standpoint, and, and I've been in a little bit of litigation. I've owning five different home improvement companies and being a CEO of a $30 million company for 11 years. And the fact is that, lit- you know, you can litigate against anybody. But in this business, if a fan is touched outside of the ring, the wrestler is always going to lose the litigation. If the fan comes through the ropes, comes into the ring, the wrestler will be allowed to protect themselves without fear of litigation. So there's that fine line that if they're on the outside, you you really can't do anything. If they're on the inside, you're pretty safe. But typically what's been happening lately is a lot of guys have been followed down to the ring. And, you know, a few have jumped in. But you really have to be careful how you handle this because, you know, we're in an age where everybody sues everybody, and that's exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, we want to see fans protected. We want to see wrestlers protected. And there has to be some kind of line drawn in the sand, I think. Well, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show on Angry Marks Podcast Network. Uh, You can go to angrymarks.com, click the podcast button, and get – some awesome shows every day of the week, and uh, check that out on angrymarks.com. If you uh, are listening to us on a mobile device, you can go to the iTunes store to the podcast app, and uh, you can hit the subscribe button, and uh, it gets downloaded right to your phone the day after we record live in the evening, and you get some great shows. Uh, Monday night, we do Raw Reaction. Tuesday nights, we obviously do the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Uh, Wednesday nights, Glove Up or Shut Up. Thursday, we've got Thursday AMP, Angry Marks Podcast with uh, Stevie J. And uh, always a great show on that. Uh, Friday, we have Impact Implosion and Over the Top Radio. And then over the weekend, we've got the SmackDown Rundown. So if you go to the podcast app on angrymarks.com, or if you go to the podcast app on your phone, and uh, keyword search Angry Marks, all one word. It'll pop up. It's got the red fist on there. You can't you can't miss it. And uh, hit that subscribe button. And if you like what we're doing here, give us a, a rating and a review, and we can uh, know what we're doing right and what we can work on. So please check that out. Um, the next topic in the uh, Hot Topics section tonight is... Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, your guys' thoughts on Sting. Uh, going into that match, I didn't, my personal opinion, I didn't have, you know, very high hopes that it'd be a great match. Sting put it all on the line. He was doing moves and bumps. You know, I hadn't seen Sting. I saw him in, in TNA, and he, of course he did WrestleMania this past year, but at 56 years of age, he was putting on a great show out there. And then towards the end of the match, he uh, did that uh, turnbuckle bomb, and and I've I've heard that it might be a broken rib. 
He, he, the trainer came out. Obviously, something was going on. It wasn't part of the show. They ended up finishing the match. Uh, you know, Drew, what, what were your thoughts on, on the Sting Seth Rollins match and how uh, Sting uh, got it through it? You know, I'll be honest with you. Unfortunately, uh, my schedule's been hectic the last couple of days. I only got to watch the first half of the pay per view, but mm-hmm. I've heard so much about it and everything I've heard is that, you know, everyone's amazed how hard he worked. And that's, that's, you know, just, a tribute to that guy. I mean, Steam all, you rise to the occasion, a guy like that in that type of atmosphere. And it, it was good to hear that, you know, he went out there and put on a good show. Q, did you have an opportunity didn't, didn't to see, see it? it? You know, I did see the part, uh, I did see the match with Sting and I thought that he worked extremely hard out there and all credit in the world to him. He's a little bit older than me, not by much. And, uh, I go out and do maybe four or five matches a year. And I try to do the same thing, you know, I, I wrestle Damian Wayne and, and I take, you know, a lot of big heel bumps, super flexes off the top, stuff like that. So, at, and I'm a, I'm at 55, he's at 56. I can tell you that it's not easy and there, you need some time to heal in between matches. But what I heard, and I don't know if this is, I can't verify this to be in fact, but I heard that he actually hurt something in his neck that could possibly be career ending. I don't know whether that's true that's or not. But, but That's I give what I heard trem- as well. Yeah, I give him tremendous credit for going out there and wrestling like he was 35, not 56. Cause that, that takes a special individual to go out and do that and, and have no fear of what's going to happen. You know, you just want to give the fans, you know, Sting's old school. He's working for the fans. He's not working for the boys in the back. He's not working for the internet marks. He's working for the fans. So I think he did a fantastic job. I can't say really enough good things about him. Excellent, excellent. Uh, once again, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show. We're on angrymarks.com. Uh, next week, we've got scheduled with us uh, a great woman's competitor, and Drew knows her from uh, Heroes and Legends. She's the Heroes and Legends Women's Champion, Mary Elizabeth Monroe. And uh, also next week, one of my buddies, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to have him on, and I'm really interested to see what the wrestler's perspective of this is. R.D. Reynolds, who runs WrestleCraft.com. Uh, he has a podcast of his own called WrestleCraft Radio, and uh, he's the author of uh, several different books, uh, most notably The Death of WCW, uh, which is in its 10th year anniversary printing. So I'm looking forward to hear what you guys have to say about that. Uh, before we move on to our next topic, uh, Q, for, for our listeners that weren't able to be on last week, uh, you know, obviously people in the know, uh, know exactly who you are, but maybe for, uh, some of the younger listeners or, or first time to our podcast, uh, can you give, uh, our listeners, uh, your, your credentials and, and, uh, why you were selected as the new host of the Undisputed Wrestling Show? Sure, Zane. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, my wife and I were creating the, re- the webpage for my wrestling school, Evolution Wrestling Academy here in Eastern North Carolina today. And I said, can I write my bio from a third person? She's like, no, <laughs> no, you can't. I said, well, then I'm not going to list what I've done in the business because I feel like that's putting my ego in front of the business, which I'll never do. So we had a little debate about that, but you know, um, without, without being egomaniacal, I, I, uh, you know, I was born and raised in upstate New York. Um, I, uh, left everybody I knew, every family member, every relative in the days before the internet, the days before cell phones. And I moved 5,000 miles away from home, landed in Honolulu, Hawaii, which in 1982, brother, was a foreign country. It wasn't the 50th state. I landed there, uh, because I was told by Lars Anderson, and Peter Maivia's wrestling school, Plotamus, Plotamus Settlement, they would train me. And the only other two options were Minnesota and Calgary, and that was as cold as upstate New York, and I didn't want that. So I went there, and uh, I got turned away from Lars Anderson, told I wasn't big enough at six foot one, two twenty five. Went to Maivia's, was told I wasn't big enough, but followed them to where they trained and hung out at training for a couple of weeks till they finally said, all right, we'll train you. And, uh, I trained at Peter Maivia's wrestling school in Honolulu, Hawaii, 1982 and 83. Uh, for people that don't know, Peter Maivia is the grandfather of Dwayne Johnson, the rock. Uh, he is the son of Peter's daughter, Peter and Leah Maivia's daughter. And he is the son of Rocky Johnson. So 
you know, it's got great roots and it was great wrestling. And Siva Afi was there, who was a star, who never acted like a star with us. He, you know, I'm still friends with Siva 30 some years later. He's back in Samoa. Um, I have nothing but love and respect for him because he treated all of us in training like we were his equal. And at that particular time, he was being seen before 1 billion people a week in Pacific Polynesian pro wrestling. So, you know, it, w- it was a great time to get in the business. And I worked in Hawaii for a while. Then I came back to the States. I, I uh, settled in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1988, five years in the business, I just didn't feel like I needed, I, I knew enough. So I contacted Luthez, who ran a school in Norfolk, Virginia, called Luthez Norfolk Academy. His trainer, Mark Fleming, was there, who's done 30-some tours in Japan. And I went down and spent eight months with the great Luthez. And that really rounded me out and gave me a career uh, that I, you know, I, I could have done a variety of different things, but I was able to protect myself in the ring with no matter who I was in there with. And I wrestled, uh, uh, really seasoned myself on the independents. And I, I think I was a really good wrestler and a really good shooter. But the problem was in 1993, 94, 95, there was no market for that guy in the States. So in 1994, I entered into a program with a guy named Tom Brandy, who wrestled as Johnny Gunn, later went on to be Salvatore Sincere in the WWE, and then back to his regular persona, real name Tom Brandy. And we went into a year-long program where we battled each other First, it started in the IPWA, and it was once a month, but it was booked in the uh, MEWF. It was booked in New Jersey. It was booked in Pennsylvania. Tom and I were two big guys. They really took it to the limit every single night. And uh, we ended up working each other probably 50 times in that first year and a half. And that's what took me from being a wrestler to being a worker. And there's a huge difference in those two things. Um, and, you know, I, I owe a lot of my career to Tom Brandy and what he taught me out there. And, Guys like Jimmy Cicero who tagged with me and Julio De Niro, who was my, my buddy in, 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 you know, early in his career when he was Julio Sanchez and me, uh, Julio Sanchez, Jimmy Cicero and I lived within 40 minutes of each other. We traveled a lot together. And of course, then we brought in Joey Mercury and Christian York and guys like that. So that's kind of my background in the wrestling business. You know, I was, uh, I was a, a good wrestler and a good shooter, but when I met Tom and started working with him, I learned to be, you know, one of those guys that understood what the business was really all about. Well, thank you. That was great. Uh, can you talk a little about uh, Mid uh, Mid Atlantic Wrestling League? Uh, Mid Atlantic Wrestling League. It, it, it's called Mall, and it's got you know, if you guys have seen, it, it's got the Grizzly Bear, and it's got M A W L, which stands for Mid Atlantic Wrestling League. It's kind of the Mall M A U L acronym. What we were searching for with that is an old school feel to a new promotion. And uh, my guy who does all my graphics, he created the graphics for the Undisputed Wrestling Show here, uh, Jazz Kumar, who's on Facebook is JK. is uh, You know, he does a lot of stuff for AML and WrestleCade and a lot of MMA stuff and UFC stuff. And he's extremely talented. And uh, I hooked him up about five years ago in the wrestling business with some people. He's able to turn the graphics he does in wrestling and MMA into a full-time living. Um, and so he's always been very grateful to me. So he does a lot of my, he does all my stuff. He runs my YouTube page. He uh, created the logo for the middle Atlantic wrestling league. And, you know, it was ironic. I told him, I said, jazz, this has to be, have an old school feel, but it can't look too old because we don't want to turn away younger fans. So he came up with the grizzly bear and the logo. And I thought it was phenomenal. And for the evolution wrestling Academy, he took a rough drawing done by my friend, Sean Denny in Tidewater, Virginia, and turned it into the logo for the Evolution Wrestling Academy. Uh, cause, you know, what, what's important to me, and this is something I've learned in wrestling and, and Tracy Mar- Myers, who runs AML with Brian Hawks and runs WrestleCade, um, and owns a very successful car dealership, taught me a lot about branding and how you have to be your brand. And, you know, it, it's an amazing thing that when you, when you realize this and you decide to be your brand, and, you know, whenever I go out in public in this town, I'm wearing my brand. And I get asked about it all the time. And, you know, that's that's a crucially important thing. As a wrestler, we got to be our brand. As a promotion, we have to be our brand. And that brand has to be recognizable within the area in which we run our events or wrestle our shows in. So, you know, I've, I've learned an awful lot of stuff, uh, both from Jazz creating a brand and, and Tracy Myers helping me establish a brand. Uh, and just, you know, it makes a big difference because in this town right now, 
Nobody remembers the other promotion that ran here six, year, six years ago and ran terrible shows. They remember Maul. They were, they're talking about the Buddy Landell Memorial Cup November 14th. They're talking about the Wild Eyed Southern boy, Tracy Smothers, coming to town facing off against three time NWA national heavyweight champion Lou Marconi in the first round. They're talking about Cue Maul Carmichael. There's nothing but wars with Damian Wayne, the AIWF world heavyweight champion. And we face each other in the first round of this tournament. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff you need to do. And that's what branding does for yourself. And that's what I've really, really learned in the past five years. Hey, Drew, I'm going to get your bio here in just a moment, um, but I, I did want to ask you uh, a, a kind of serious but kind of lighthearted question. Now, uh, as you explained on last week's show, uh, you're, you're getting into the television industry, and as I was listening to that episode, I had a great idea for you. Um, I don't know how successful it would be, so you can laugh it off if you want, um, but have you seen shows like... Uh, Kitchen Nightmares and... Uh, oh, stop it. Are you are you kidding me? I shot that pilot for that show last August. It was called Wrestle 911. Bar, uh-huh. Res- Bar Rescue meets Hell's Kitchen. And we went into a promotion in West Newton, Pennsylvania, drawing 120 people religiously. And a week after they drew 120, we created a show. There was no advertising for it except locally. I created a community awareness program. Bruce... Uh, Pritchard was the host. I was the co-host and trainer, and we sold out the building over 400 people to, within a week. And uh, absolutely, man, I think every one of us, Zane, and credit to you, I think every one of us has thought, what about a bar rescue show? What about a Kitchen Nightmare show for independent wrestling? Because it can be so horrific at its worst level, talent-wise, show-wise, everything. So uh, last August, we shot that pilot. It sets with a three-time Emmy winner named Adam Weichenfeld, who put up the money and shot that pilot and flew everybody in and took care of all the expenses. And it's been shopped at every major network and cable network. And the interesting thing was Spike said at first, and eh, we're not interested. They called back in two days and said, we want to look at it again. They called back a week later and said, it's not a no. It's just a no for now. USA loved it. They said, we have one night for wrestling, and it's dedicated to WWE, and that's our bread and butter. So we got a lot of positivity out of it, but it's still out there hanging in the wind. Hopefully it'll get bought. But I think any one of us that are passionate and love what we do have probably had this idea, and it's a great idea. Well, I I couldn't think of anybody better than you that would be able to execute that. So uh, I I do look forward to seeing that. Hopefully it'll end up on WGN or – I don't know. I've heard Destination America might have a few open slots. Uh, at the, 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 <laughs> you, you know. They may have. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Skills, uh, if, if any of our listeners have not heard your several uh, trips onto our show, uh, I want you to, to plug yourself. And, and because this is, and I'm very excited to say this, this is your first episode of the Undisputed Wrestling Show. As a co-host, not a guest co-host, not a guest, you are an official co-host uh, now on the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Man, I am. Uh, I'm stoked, man. I'm so excited to be part of the show. Uh, I said it every time I come on. I'm a huge fan of the show. I listen to it all the time, uh, regardless if I was on it or not. Uh, so you know, like I said, I was a huge fan. I'm glad to be a part of it. Q's on now. It's, it's it's doing big things, man, and I'm I'm glad to be on board. Well, you know when uh, when Rick said that he was going to be stepping, Rick the Prophet Craig was going to be stepping back and serving as the executive producer for the show, and that uh, Cue Ball Carmichael, a North Carolina guy, was going to be uh, taking over the hosting duties. I said I can't I can't be in here with uh, two North Carolina guys, Cue Ball <laughs> and, and William Huckby. I need to get some uh, 317 support. So that's uh, – I'm very happy that, that you were able to uh, join us on a full-time basis. Well, you know, Zane and Drew, I got to tell you, it's really funny, but Rick and I were talking uh, about who would be – you know, uh, and, and I look at it this way. Drew and I are both the hosts of the show. There's no host, co-host. We're the hosts, you know. And last week, Rick said, what do you think of, what do you think of Drew? I said, brother, him and I should host the show together. There's no question in my mind. He goes, I'm glad you said that because I've already decided it. So I was really excited. I think Drew and I uh, together can can add something that neither one of us singularly could 
could provide to the show. So I, I'm, I couldn't be more excited to have Drew on here with me than, than I am. Excellent. Well, I really Excellent. appreciate that. All right. Well, I appreciate it, you, and I'm happy to be here, baby. Take it away, Zane. Let's get this going. Well, as as we're waiting for our guests to to arrive this week, we've still got a couple more topics that I'd like to discuss. Uh, uh, Tank Abbott, former UFC heavyweight, and uh, he he did a stint in WCW. Uh, I mostly remember him for uh, uh, pulling a knife in the ring. It was an angle, but it was still very weird. Um, has recently come out and said that, uh, speaking of Ronda Rousey, uh, he can beat any woman on this earth. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Tank Abbott. I will fight any woman on this earth for free. If I win, which is going to happen, and you're going to get bashed up good, you have to make me a sandwich. If you win, I'll give you $100,000. Uh, <laughs> what are you guys' thoughts on... Uh, Tank Abbott basically challenging Ronda Rousey. Well, I, I'll tell you from my standpoint, because I'm a huge UFC nut, um, Tank Abbott is way past his prime, number one. Number two, I don't think he's got a hundred grand in the bank if he counts <laughs> all his family's money, number two. And number three, you know what? Of course a guy can beat a girl. You know what? Uh, great job, pal. You know what? You proved that a guy can beat a girl. Big deal. You know what? Fight a man. I'd fight Tank Abbott for free. I put up ten grand of my money to go to any charity. I'd fight him in the octagon. I'd tap his fat ass out. I guarantee it. Whoa! We've got an exclusive here. Let's, let's make this happen. Let's you know, do it, man. You know, if I could just jump in and make a comment for a second, Tank Abbott is funny because a hundred thousand dollars probably buys about thirty seconds of Ronda Rousey's time this day. She probably doesn't that's need right. half of that time to break his arm off. Amen, brother. That, that's, pro- that's probably a good payday for her. <laughs> well, what, what Tank, are your thoughts, Drew? Tank, uh, I, I agree with you. Tank is, Tank is past his prime. Uh, I also agree that there probably is not a woman on the planet that can beat him, but big man. <laughs> you know what I mean? What, what do you do, buddy? You know, and if, uh, if he won't fight Keith, then I'll fight him. I don't, uh, I don't got 10 grand to spend to put up on it, but I'll fight him for free. And, uh, if he beats me, then, uh, I'll come a good job. But I doubt that it would happen. I'm not putting my money on Tank no matter what. He's 20 years past his prime. And besides that, yeah, thank if, he's not, if he's not allowed any coke or meth, he can't fight worth a shit anyway. <laughs> well, uh, I, Kill a Kev, our producer who just chimed in, uh, he did send me some information. Uh, Abbott is, Two and ten, two wins and ten losses since 2003, and uh, he is 50 years old at this time. So uh, I, I I would put my money on either of you guys. Um, but you know, no, speaking, go ahead. There's no doubt. I would I would I would take a fight tomorrow with Tank Abbott. I almost you uh, know I got all the utmost respect for this guy in the world, but I almost had a uh, fight with uh, an MMA fight with Dan Severn. But unfortunately, uh, Severn wanted a little bit. He said, you know, and of course he was right. I, I wasn't, you know, no fighter at the time as far as having a record or anything. So it was a, a lose-lose for him. If he beats me, big deal. He beats someone on their first fight. If he loses, then, you know, it kills him. Uh, so he wanted a whole lot of money. But it was real close to happening, me and, me and uh, Dan Severn in a fight. I would love to fight Tank Abbott now. Q, have you ever uh, been involved in a MMA shoot mm-hmm. fight? Let me tell you something, my friend. I was Dan Severn's tackle buddy in the mid nineties. <laughs> Dan, Dan worked for me at the IPWA, which was a federation I ran from 1995 to 2002, wrestled at a little underground bar in Northern Virginia called the Secret Cove. And Dan Severn, I booked him knowing that he was going to beat Kem Shamrock in May of 1996. And surely he did. And he walked into my federation. Be coming off fresh off a UFC win over Ken Shamrock, Ken Shamrock, and wrestled a guy named Jimmy Z and tapped him out. I told Dan, I said, Dan, it's got to go five minutes. I got to get my money's worth. Five minutes, five mm-hmm. seconds, he tapped the guy out. <laughs> but you know, Dan did a Dan did a uh, a seminar that day in Manassas, Virginia, at a karate studio. And of course, I picked Dan up and went over to the hotel with him and his son. 
and over to the karate studio, and he goes, hey, you're a wrestler, right? You're a tough guy. I said, I, I, I don't know. I don't really think of myself like that. And he goes, I'm going to use you to demonstrate submissions on. Now, I'm a guy who doesn't bruise very easily, but I can tell you that my arms and legs were covered in bruises the next day. So Dan Dan was a badass, man, absolutely. In his prime, he was a bad man. But you know what? He was a really nice guy, too. He worked a lot for Dennis Corluzzo in the NWA in New Jersey, and he was very personable and a nice guy. Uh, when I went to WWE in 96 through 99 as regional enhancement talent, Dan was up there a lot, and uh, as was Shamrock. And, you know, Dan was a really nice guy, a true gentleman. Well, we have had Dan Severn on the show several times. Uh, I believe he's been on three times. So our listeners can go back and look at our archives if they go to the Undisputed Wrestling Show dot Weebly. That's W E E B L Y dot com. The Undisputed Wrestling Show dot Weebly dot com. They can check out all of our archives, including our several episodes with Dan Severn. Uh, and Drew Skills and Cue Ball Carmichael. Uh, so, uh, they should definitely check that out and they should check out our upcoming guests, Mary Elizabeth Monroe next week, the Heroes and Legends women's champion and, uh, WrestleCrap.com founder and author of The Death of WCW, R.D. Reynolds. Uh, and then that's next week. And then on the sixth, I know both you guys are looking forward to this show. Both guests are going to be amazing, and both guests have personal ties to uh, each of you. Uh, in the uh, 9 o'clock hour, we've got the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, Jax Dane. Yes. And, and then in the second hour, trainer to the stars, including Drew, Mr. Drew Skills, Les Thatcher is going to be on that show. That is going to be yeah. an amazing show. Oh, yeah. You know what? I can't wait to interview Mary Elizabeth Moreau. I was chatting with her the other day because we're Facebook friends. And, you know, her and Drew both were trained by Les Thatcher. And Les Thatcher, uh, to me, I, I look up to very few people, um, mainly because I'm 6'3", sort of a height, height joke. But I look up to very few people in the wrestling business because, to me, and Lou has taught me this, you have to have integrity, and you can never sell that integrity or you never had it in the first place. And to me, Les Thatcher is one of those guys. He's a personal friend of mine. Uh, we talked about a month and a half ago for two and a half hours. Les is the epitome of what I hope to be someday. So, you know, and that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to have Drew co-host, but to have Mary Elizabeth Monroe on the show. I mean, and Les Thatcher coming down the line. I mean, how great is this? Yeah. Uh, oh, it's awesome. The Prophet Rick Craig has been uh, lining up some great guests, as well as our uh, new uh, host, Drew Skills, has been helping out, getting some of his buddies on here. So, uh, we, you know, it's, it's going to be an amazing fall on the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Um, next topic, I wanted to briefly discuss, and we, we can talk a little longer on it, but I brought this up on past shows, and I wanted to get, uh, but I haven't discussed it with you two. Uh, we had mentioned that uh, Tank Abbott was challenging Ronda Rousey, and that got me on a train of thought of what are your two opinion on intergender matches um, where it's a woman <laughs> wrestling a man? Is, is are there you serious? Question? I got to <laughs> ask you, are you serious? Did you not see my profile picture and my Facebook page where I'm choking out Mae Young? <laughs> oh, well, I have seen that. And, and... <laughs> But, but you know, they, they've, it's changed a lot since then. There's there's a great mini-doc um, out on YouTube about it, and it's about uh, Veda Scott and Gregory Iron, uh, their, their feud. You know, so, you know, is there a place for it, and does it go too far? Is it, you know, would you want to see it once a night? Would you want to see a whole card of it? You know, what are your, what are your thoughts on it, Q, since, since you've had the pleasure of working with Miss May Young? Well, you know, I, here's the thing. It has to be in the proper context. Now, surely when uh, Dino Devine and I were the Maryland Championship Wrestling, which, as you know, is a pretty big independent and has been for nearly 20 years, um, when we wrestled May and Moolah, it was strictly a, a match based on entertainment. You know, it was uh, 
It was crazy. One of the funny things is I got Mula or I got May up over my head. I'm going to body slam her. And, and now she's got to be 70 something at this age. She goes, honey, slam me over the top rope to the floor. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, May, I don't want to kill you. I just want to wrestle you. <laughs> so, but it was funny. But you know, I had plenty of matches in the nineties. Debbie Combs, Cora Combs' daughter, Debbie Combs and I tagged up against Malaya Hosaka and Doink or anybody else that she had with her and did plenty of tag team intergender matches and stuff. And they can be extremely entertaining and they can be fun. And, you know, the old school Southern chicken shit heel can look great in those matches. But I think if you're going to do it as a shoot style match, it really is not something that's going to draw many people. Although I will tell you, some of the girls in NXT could probably kick a lot of the guys on the independence butt in a match. What do you have to say, uh, Heroes and Legends champion, Drew Skills? I think uh, Q hit it right on the nose. It's got to be in the right context. You know, I, I was trained in the art of pro wrestling. You know, we've been talking about less and, and things like that. And what we're doing out there is we're, we're having people believe into the simulation of a competition that we're fighting each other. And, you know, when they're doing these intergender matches that are competitive, uh, I can't get behind those. It just, it, it, it's something in me. I can't, I can't do it. But it, it's, it's, it takes away from any realty that they're, they're having a fight. Because, you know, there's weight classes in, amongst the women. Uh, you know, uh, Ronda Rousey, I said it before on the show, Ronda Rousey is, is one of the top two women fighters. I, I'm not going to say she's better than Cyborg, but she's, uh, they are, they are the top two. And neither one of them are beating a man in the same weight class. Can they kick a guy's ass on the street? 100%. Can some of these girls that are having great intergender matches, competitive matches, kick a guy's ass on the street? Sure they can. I got no doubt. They can. And some of the fans in the crowd, some of these women would kick their ass. But when it comes to uh, another wrestler, uh, I think you're. Uh, uh, that's where you lose me. But uh, I think it does have a place, uh, entertainment-wise, like, like uh, Q was saying, the chicken shit heel. I think can get over really well in situations like that. You know, the whole, uh, you know, several people have done it, and, and I think it can be done, but I just don't like it when it's done com- as a competitive competition match. I, I think you're right. It's just not believable from a competitive match because, you know, I mean, I have, uh, I'll give you an idea. You, know, you guys know who Sonny Ono is, right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Sonny had, had a girl that trained with him for many years, and she lived in Northern Virginia, and she was running a self-defense class, and we got talking one day, and this is about 10 years ago, and I had been down to WCW with Julio Sanchez and, 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 and been to the, been to the uh, power plant and things, and I met Sonny. And Sonny, you know, if you don't know it, Sonny's really, truly a badass. I mean, he, he crippled the average guy. But this girl said to me, she said, I understand that there's no way that I could legitimately beat a man your size. Now she's probably five three, one ten at the time. I'm six three, two seventy five, and diesel. And she goes, if there's a corner and you get me into it, I'm done. And you know, I said there's a lot to be said for that because that's that's a fact. I mean, a competitive, genuine fighter, a UFC fighter in the hundred and twenty five or thirty pound cat- weight category is not going to lose to a Ronda Rousey or to anybody who's competitive. But that's why those matches on a competitive basis suck. They will never draw money. They'll never be, uh, you know, entertainment. So you, you've got to do it in the right context of things. And done in the wrong, it's just not a moneymaker. And I tell you, I think, uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, you touched, Q, on, on the girls at NXT. I think now uh, you'll see less of it because there's more girls that can go. And unfortunately, what was happening, I think, a lot of times was you had these girls that could go, and, uh, you know, they're so far and few apart. So they were having matches with guys just to be able to show how good they are, which, you know, it, it's, it's great that they can go out there and do those things, but it's just, it, it takes you out of the realm of uh, reality. You are 100% correct, Drew. You're ex- yeah, that's the nail on the head right there, brother. Well, since we're since you had mentioned that there are so few women out there that can really go right now, Drew, uh, who are some of the women's wrestlers that you want to put over? Now, if if 
your name is not mentioned, it doesn't mean that Drew and Q-Ball aren't huge fans of you. This is just off the top of their heads. Yeah, one of them is, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to her next week, Mary Melissa. Mary Elizabeth Monroe. Bingo. Monroe, Monroe. definitely. Uh, definitely. She's one of them. Uh, Heidi Loveless. She's been having, uh, a lot of matches with men lately. Uh, and she can go. I think, you know, put her with another woman and it's a great match. Put her with, you know, these matches she's having with guys that just, it, it doesn't, visually doesn't look right to me, but she is one hell of a worker. Um, and then you got, uh, Hardcore Heather Owens in Ohio is a good uh, worker as well. There's there's a few of them out there, and there's uh, you know Kimberly and and Amber O'Neill and uh, several several women are Gallows now. There's several of them out there that can go uh, and have really great matches. I just I just want to see them wrestle each other. I'm a big fan Not of Cameron yet. Starr. You guys you guys see Cameron Starr wrestle at all? Maggie Hassler. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's uh, she's right here in town. I've known yeah, Cameron for years and years. Oh, oh, me too. You know, and we've done radio shows together, actually, or podcasts. And uh, she cusses like a sailor. I love her. Yes, but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, I think she, you know, and since she has really taken fitness to the next level and lost that weight, I mean, she looks fantastic, and she can wrestle. And you know, there's 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 plenty of plenty of girls at NXT that can go. And, uh, you know, I look around and I, I, I see some of these girls like Mary Elizabeth Moreau, um, I, Jake Christ's wife. I'm not sure what she wrestles. Nevaeh. Yeah, Nevaeh. Nevaeh. Nevaeh Lynn or Nevaeh. I think she's really good. Um, I, I have seen a lot of lady wrestlers that are really good. I mean, Mickey Knuckles was incredible. You know, she's, she's taking the time off to have another baby, but she was incredible. But there's a lot of really good women out there on the independents that could go down to NXT and I think carry themselves really well. Well, I'm gonna uh, I can't believe I, I can't believe I forgot her name. It's Sarah. Uh, uh, da, 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 Crazy Mary Dobson. Uh, Crazy Mary Bodner. Crazy Sarah Mary Dobson. How can yes. I forget her? She's, She's awesome. I love Mary. She's awesome. Oh my, oh my God. She, she sent me a match about four years ago, five years ago. She said, Pondo said to send this to you. Send me a match. She's what can I do different? I critiqued her on about five or six matches, and then she sent me a match that was just kick ass, bro. I said, "Okay, yeah. you got it. You understand what you're doing now." But yeah, crazy. Oh my god, crazy Mary Sarah Bridges. She's you know she's one of those girls that could get signed tomorrow and be right in the thick of things. She's unbelievable. Sure. She's she's appeared on, on NXT programming, uh, right? Uh, Another another girl, Maya Yim, has been on NXT but hasn't been picked up yet. She's great. And I want to put over uh, two ladies that I saw uh, in the last year. Uh, Santana Garrett, uh, who is uh, uh, the NWA Women's Champion, I believe. I'm not sure if she still holds it. I saw her in June, and she was the NWA Women's Champion. She's great. I, I saw her she. down in Florida. And uh, Melanie Cruz, who wrestles out of Chicago, and, and she's done tours of Japan. She's great, too. Uh, so uh, keep your eyes open for, for those guys. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, having worked back in the day with Malaya Hosaka and Brandy Wine and Debbie Combs, I'm, a, I'm an enormous fan of, I always call them lady wrestlers. I'm an enormous fan of lady wrestling. You know, I have been my whole life. I support them 100%. Um, it, it, you know, I don't want to say this to be negative, but it's a man's business and any woman that can succeed in this, Alexi Fife was another one, you know, Darcy, Darcy, uh, what's Darcy's last name? Darcy. Oh, I feel so bad. I don't remember it. But anyway, um, you know, it's amazing to see such great young, uh, female wrestlers out there. It does my heart good because it's difficult at best to be able to succeed as, as a woman wrestler, you know? A friend of mine for 20 years, Fantasia, succeeded and did very well at it. And, uh, you know, Lady Victoria, of course. So, you know, I, I just think it's a, it's a, we need more women in the sport today and we need to have a competitive women's division. I think that would attract a lot of people, not divas, but a competitive women's edition, uh, you know, division. I agree. Well, I, I actually asked, uh, Rock and Robin, Robin Smith on this show. It's about, a year and a half ago or so, asked her her thoughts on the, the television show Total Divas, and she said she was fine with it because they were divas. They weren't wrestlers. Um, so I, I think that that says a lot. And I, I would I would love to see a resurgence in, in that. And 
you know, one uh, person that has been bringing that back is uh, Sexy Star in Lucha Underground. And Lucha Underground has been picked up for a second season on the El Rey Network. Uh, That's fantastic news. Yeah. Uh, what What are your thoughts on Lucha Underground and, and the possibility of more places for guys and gals to work? Well, I can tell you, if I can jump in there, I love it. You know, I think the match between Vampiro and Pentagon Jr. that was Vampiro's first match in 10 years was absolutely the best match I saw last year. And I saw a lot of matches. I think it was just incredible. It brought old school selling into it. It told a story. It had a twist at the end. I, you know, I, I, I Twittered Vampiro the day after I saw it. I said, Father, this is fantastic. I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. And then I started watching more Lucha Underground. And I got to tell you, I'm excited about it. I think it's fantastic. It's an alternative product. And that's what the business needs. You know, so many promoters go out there and they try to be Vince Jr. And let me tell you, if you, if you mimic the WWE, you are destined for one thing and that's failure. You cannot do that. You have to offer something as an alternative so people can go and watch something different. And I think that they're doing a phenomenal ground at Lucha, at Lucha Underground. I think they're doing a phenomenal job and I'm really happy for the success and, and proud of Vampiro and Pentagon Jr. And, and all the guys down there. I mean, John Morrison's down there. He's doing phenomenal. I just think it's great. What are your thoughts, Drew? Oh, it's it's awesome for the business, man, for, uh, to have, like like you said, an alternative, uh, something for fans to watch. Unfortunately, I don't have the L-Ray Network, uh, so I've only watched a few matches uh, where I've YouTubed and watched the individual matches, but I haven't watched the program uh, and how it's put together. So uh, I don't know a whole lot about that. But the fact that it's out there is is great. Uh, another place for, for people to be able to aspire to get to. Uh, the more places that there are to aspire to get to, the, the more motivation is to work hard. And the, the more people that work hard, the better the industry gets. You know, it's, yeah. funny that, it's funny that you say that, Drew, because as I was writing up this this bio for this web page today, and, you know, you got to have – uh, about us and what we offer and all this stuff. And it's all new to me because I don't, I don't like talking about me because what I've always preached in the business is hang up your ego at the door when you come in the locker room and we can do great things together. So I don't want to possess an ego when I do this, but it's, it's difficult not, not to write it when I do. But you know, there, there is some amazing stuff happening now in the wrestling business. I think we're at the, at a great place. We, I mean, Let's be honest. We've got federations like I work for, and I'm blessed to work for them as a manager, Omega, to draw a thousand plus at every show. Uh, you know, Luke Hawks group, Wildcat down in Louisiana is drawing a thousand plus at a show. There's a group in Little Rock drawing a thousand plus, a group in New York drawing a thousand plus. So some independents are doing great. There's Ring of Honor, there's TNA, and you know, one thing about Dixie is she's a survivor. She'll find another network that'll take her. It's just the way it works. And, you know, uh, Ring of Honor is doing great things. And, and WWE, of course, is WWD. But Jeff Jarrett's Global Force is, is starting to get a little bit of momentum with it. I, I like to see a couple of different things happen with it uh, that I think would make it successful. But that's my own thing. And, you know, there's some really good, solid wrestling companies that are setting on the crux of exploding and being able to give people work where they can actually do what we did in the 80s and 90s, and that is make a living at being a professional wrestler without being at the WWE. So I, I'm just pumped about the business and the way things are going right now. I think it's at, at a crux where it's going to explode, and there's just you know phenomenal opportunity for the young guys. I mean, I'm way past my prime, but you know the young guys that I train and work with and mentor, there's tremendous opportunity for them these days. Q Ball, are you are you familiar with a uh, guy named Congo Kong? Oh my God, I got to tell you about him. I saw him a year and a half ago, uh, May 2014, and when I saw him physically, I'm like, yeah, I'm not impressed. And then I saw him wrestle, and I was like, oh my God, he was phenomenal. Yeah, he was a he was a big part of the uh, Global Force tapings, TV tapings, and. Hopefully that will lead to to some uh, national exposure for him. Uh, Drew, uh, can you can you tell uh, Q Ball uh, a little about your knowledge with Congo Kong? 
Oh, man, uh, me and Kong go way back. I've, I've told him to his face, and I'll be happy to say it here so more people can hear it. Uh, I'm so proud of uh, of Kong, of Steve, and where he's came. When I first met him, uh, he, he couldn't get booked to save his life. He was working for one place and one place only. And, uh, you know, he, the where where he's come, where he's at now versus back then is, is so, so different. Leaps and bounds. This guy, uh, you know, he worked really hard at developing, uh, his, his coming into his own and, and, you know, taking this Kong character and, uh, being able to come out of a show with it. Uh, you know, he was, like I said, it's, just, I'm, I'm real proud of Steve. I've known him for, for several years and to see him from when I first met him, uh, threw him up on my shoulders and threw him around <laughs> and, uh, cause he let me and, uh, you know, to where he is today is, is amazing. He's a great guy, too, which always makes it that much better. Hey, guys, I, I just wanted to share with you. I got a message from Greg Buck, who's a referee in Tennessee, and he's uh, going to come in and do a couple matches for us on the Buddy Landell Memorial Cup. And he was going to tune into the show tonight. I had a lot of friends that were tuning in. And his statement is cute. It's an awesome show. All of you guys are great. So I wanted to pass it on to you guys that, you know, we have a guy who's a referee in the business who's pretty talented, knows what he's doing, worked with some of the biggest stars in the business, and he's enjoying the show and, and thinking we're doing a great job. So, you know, that's all the validation I need. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Buck. We, we really appreciate that. And, you know, this is a new format for us, and uh, it's we're excited about the changes, and uh, the Prophet Rick Craig is – left uh, us in very good hands, and, and Kilikev's working the ones and the twos. So, uh, you know, keep tuning back in uh, week after week because it's only going to get better. We're really looking forward to it. And uh, definitely like us on Facebook at the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Uh, like us on or follow us on Twitter. Uh, it's T-U-W-S Podcast. It's at T-U-W-S Podcast. Uh, so those are some of the ways that our, our listeners – can uh, find out more about what's going on on the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Um, and you know what's great, Thane? You know what's great? Yes, sir. Is, is uh, we still don't, the Morning Star is yet to join us. He'll still be, he'll be on with us later, right? So it's only going to get better. Yeah, he should be on any time now. He, he usually makes his appearance uh, in the main event. Uh, at the ten o'clock <laughs> hour, so pretty much looking. And you guys, the, you guys, you guys all, you guys all know that Will and I are really good personal friends, right? Oh no! Right on. He, li- he lives <laughs> less than an hour from me. Yeah, he uh, he uh, showed up at my Harley race. I had a seminar with Harley race three years ago. He showed up in it and uh, did an outstanding job. And I'm a huge fan of Hawks. Uh, he's a great guy, good friend, solid dude. Uh, but I hate him anyway. <laughs> hey, you know, you know what, guys? Hey, you know, it's so great oh. to hear y'all talk stuff oh, about me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we talked, yeah. we talked him up. We talked him up. Hey, 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 hey Hawk, you know what? You you know, know, hey, Hawk, Hawk, you, you know why you're yeah. still the NWA Continental Champion? Why is that? Do you know why you're? Because you haven't wrestled me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you. Well, you know what? You know what, Q? Unlike some champions, you know what I'm saying? You know, I have no problem facing anybody, man. You know, some some guys like to stay protected, stay in their own little area. I ain't going to make sure they stay Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Easy. Um, Easy. You know, You know what, one, brother? You know, you know what, brother? <laughs> you know Q. what the problem is? Here's what the problem is, Will. If you and I wrestled, we'd blow the roof off the building so damn high, nobody else would ever be able to compete with it. Oh, oh well. <laughs> hey, my fault. Now, Zane, what, what you about to for, for, forgot to tell you about that Harley Race seminar is that I was like 290 pounds of fat. <laughs> like, I was nowhere near in great shape like I am now. Like, I was I was pretty fat back then, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I had that whole Kevin Steen mentality or, or the Chris Hero mentality where it was like, Hey, as long as I can work, as long as I have psychology, who cares what I look like, you know? Uh, and, and it took that seminar and meeting Q Ball and Harley Race and everybody else and stuff and Tito and, uh, to really change my mentality about, you know, getting in shape and eating better and going to the gym. So I really have a lot to think for Q Ball and a couple completely. other guys. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you, well, have, you have made a hundred percent change and difference in the way you look 
and the way you work in the ring, brother. I'm so proud of you. I, I, I really can't tell you enough that I'm proud of what you've done and the accomplishments and the training and the dedication that you've committed yourself to in the past two years. Well, you know, you know, really, you know, and I'm, this is, this show isn't about me, although it should be. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, so I do, man. I just, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with in professional wrestling. You know what I'm saying? I feel like I've been very blessed to have, you know, probably one of the best, one, probably one of the best junior heavyweights in the world, uh, riding in the car beside me and keeping me motivated to be better and better every week. Uh, and that's my buddy Joe Black and stuff. And then I'm very fortunate to be on a lot of the shows I'm on and be able to travel and stuff and see a lot of the great talent that's out there in the Indies, you know, like Drew Skills and Congo Kong and, 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 and big Russ Jones and stuff. And even down in Georgia with, uh, Jimmy Rave and Cedric Alexander and Chip Day. And even the guys in Texas, even though I, I bust their balls on occasion, you know what I'm saying? Even the guys in Texas, you know, Houston Carson and Mike Dale. So I've been very fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of those guys, man. Amen, brother. Well, that actually leads me into uh, my next topic was uh, Kevin Sullivan was recently interviewed. He's been on our show before, uh, so you can go to our archives and check that out. But recently uh, he said he had this to say. Mm. Let me ask you something. Kevin Owens, who everybody is jumping up and down over, can you name a person besides Cactus Jack to get over like that with a shirt on? Name me one. If you ask me who hit 500 home runs, I can name you 10 off the top of my head. So why does everybody say these guys have to be pushed? If you're an athlete and walking down the street at 2 a.m., John Cena is walking on the left, Kevin Owens is on the right, which side of the street are you going to get up on? They need to want to be you or be afraid to fight you. I think they've tried to make a chance, and people listening to the pounding of the drum, that have ratings or attendance gone up, we don't want to listen to when people tell us what to do. For 14 years, the ratings have went down. That happened in college football. Would those people still have a job? Coaches would get cut for not doing their jobs. Players would get cut. So uh, so uh, the taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan, kind of putting it on uh, WWE for not producing superstars, but he specifically uh, mentioned Kevin Owens and uh, fighting with a shirt on. So, Will, you've changed your body over the last couple of years. Do you think that that has helped you get bookings and helped you get over? Uh, for for me, yes. Um, it has definitely helped me uh, get over better, with, not only with the fans, but uh, with a lot of veterans and stuff, and a lot of guys who have more experience with me in the locker room because it's uh, shown them and proven to them that I'm actually taking my craft very seriously. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't completely wholeheartedly agree with, with, with Kevin Sullivan. Um, you know, there's a 90% rule. Like you all like to say, there's a 90% rule. Uh, 90% of us out there in the Indies need to go to the gym, need to eat better, need to work out. Uh, but there's, you know, a small few people like Kevin Stain who don't need to work out. You know, they're genetically, uh, they're genetic freaks. Their charisma and their work and stuff and the way they carry themselves, uh, gets them over. You know, he's, he's at one in the, he's at one in a hundred thousand. Uh, who can look the way he looks and act the way he acts and dress the way he dresses and still get over. Uh, it only happens one a generation. You can't, now as far as him blaming WWE for not creating superstars, I, I don't think that they're not, uh, creating superstars. I think that the problem is, is that they don't have enough faith in their young guys, uh, to give them the reins. Um, that's just my opinion. I don't know, Q Ball might see it differently, but, uh, I have to somewhat disagree with Kevin, Kevin Sullivan on that. Right, Q, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are this, and they, they've never varied. Um, as you walk to the ring, and let's say you're on an independent show with, you know, a thousand people, when you walk to that ring and you walk up those steps in that ring, your look has to tell 90% of the men in that audience that they should not fuck with you. And it should say that, you know what, I'm a bad dude, and if you mess with me, you're going to get hurt. And that doesn't matter whether you look like Kevin Owens, a ballroom brawler, or whether you look like Kevin Sullivan, who was was smaller but in incredible shape. The fans cannot look at you as somebody that they can take, or you're not going to get the respect and you're not going to get over. So you, you've got to have that persona. And, and, and my personal opinion that people are just like the guys are like, ah, ah, you know, I might be able to kick his butt, but I'm not sure. But if you're walking to the ring and you, and this is the mistake that all indie wrestlers make, 
They want to walk the ring in circles and you expose yourself size wise and everything else to the guys in the ring or guys in the audience. You need to go straight up those steps, go straight in that ring, get on that stage like a Broadway actor gets on his stage and you need to strut yourself around there and put the fear of God in people. Because if I think as a fan I could beat your ass, I'm not going to be impressed with that wrestling show. But that's my thinking. What about you, Miss Bills? You don't have to, you don't have to be a bodybuilder to do that. Don't get me wrong. You just got to look like you're a tough mf -er. Yeah, I think, uh, I totally agree with Q. You have to look the part. Uh, what, what, what it is, what your part is, uh, varies from, from different people. You have savages, you have, uh, technicians, you have all these different, different, uh, gimmicks, but you have to look that part. If you can't, you know, look like, uh, Nate Webb and, and put, uh, makeup on your face and now I believe that you're a, uh, savage. You know, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to look the part. Now, does Nate Webb, you know, does he go out there and they do what he does and get over with the crowd? 100%. But he's doing him. You know, Congo Kong is doing Congo Kong. You have to look the part, just like you said. Not everyone has to be a bodybuilder. The thing of it is, is that not everyone can do that. It is a, uh, you know, a very small percentage. I agree with, with, uh, Kevin Sullivan on that, that you know, there's not that many people that can pull it off. So that's why you need to get in shape is because if you're not one of those people that can do it, then by getting in shape, it makes you look better than the, the fans that are sitting in the average fans that are sitting in the crowd. Just because you're hitting the gym and you're, you're in shape and you have that, uh, you know, superhero look just by doing that makes you look like you can whoop most the majority of the people in the crowd. So if you can't pull it off, uh, without being in great shape, then that's the alternative. So that's why everyone, you know, that's why you push everyone to do it because it's a very small percentage of people that can actually pull it off. This is the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Uh, I am the bearded wonder Zane Paisley. We've got our hosts, uh, Cuball Carmichael, Drew Skills, and Will Huckabee. Um, guys, this has been kind of a fun panel. We do have some guests coming up soon. Uh, Q, I have one more quick question for you, uh, and then uh, I, I wanted to throw out a, another question for the whole panel. But sure. uh, uh, are you uh, are you friends with Matt Bloom? Uh, yeah, you know, I I met Matt when I went up there in uh, the late '90s and and did some some enhancement work with them. And it was funny because a guy I trained named Otto Schwantz had worked Matt on an indie show, and Matt Bloom loved oh, yeah, him. I've been here. And so that made a, uh, a sort of a path for Matt and I to become friends when I was up there and we talked all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really thought he was a guy who understood and got it when it comes to the business. Well, <laughs> I've got kind of a uh, absurd question for you. Uh, for, for our listeners who aren't familiar with Matt Bloom, he is, uh, the former Prince Albert, uh, Tenzai, um, he was Jason uh, Albert in uh, NXT, and now he is the head of um, training at the WWE Performance Center. And I know Q's got a lot of opinions about training, but uh, uh, <laughs> Matt Bloom is now going to be in a movie that actually came out yesterday uh, called The Dog Wedding. Um, <laughs> it's a romantic comedy uh uh, about a German businesswoman who falls for an American wrestler, uh, played by Matt Bloom, uh, while planning their English Bulldogs wedding. So, uh, if you, if you do talk to Mr. Bloom, let him know that, uh, I, I can't make it to Boston to watch the movie at the premiere, uh, but I do plan to catch it when it's out on DVD. Yeah, and then I'll ask him, why the hell would he do a movie like that and expose himself? <laughs> well, you know, you, it, it might be fun. Have you ever done anything silly uh, just just for fun uh, as as in your wrestler persona, or is it always about protecting the business? Never have I done anything that's fun, <laughs> ever. I protect the business at all costs. Okay, all right. Um well, this well, it's is, not it's not really true, but, you know, it sounded good, didn't it? Yeah, but, I was intimidated. The business is entertainment. You have to entertain. 
Um, I, if I'm established as a tough guy, I don't want to sell out by doing a sappy movie. But you know what? Movies pay a hell of a lot more than the trainer's salary at WWE. So I understand his point of maybe wanting to get in the Hollywood side of the business. Yeah, it, it, I don't know. It looks silly, but it, it might be fun. You know, uh, there have been s- several uh, wrestlers uh, who've done silly things, uh, like uh, pro wrestlers versus zombies comes to mind. That was That's my favorite about, movie ever. Now, really? Is that? I, oh, my I gosh, that, Matt. Matt and Rebby were living the real life in that movie. I loved it. <laughs> and I know uh, your buddy uh, Ryan uh, Mitchell, Mitchell had a lot to do with that. Yeah, he choreographed all the fight scenes. Yeah. So, good. And, uh, hey, you know what? Shane Douglas, who's been a friend of mine for 20 years, was in it, and they had Piper in it. So, you know, for me, it yeah. couldn't go wrong. Piper saved whatever it was you could save. Piper did his best to save it, but it was a lot of work, brother. <laughs> uh, um. Well, you know, my uh, next question is for the whole panel before we get to our uh, before we get to our guests tonight, uh, and we'll we'll start off with uh, Will Huckabee since he's had the least amount of time to uh, get himself over right now. Uh, Will, what is exciting to you in pro wrestling right now? And this can be independence, it can be Japan, it can be WWE, it can be anything. What makes you excited for pro wrestling right now? Oh, oh, Jesus, that's such a crazy question. Um, I think what makes me excited right now is actually a lot of the indies uh, are going on right now. It's almost like there's a, a revolution of, of indies uh, who are who are putting on great shows. Uh, places like PWX and Omega, um, AWE down there in Georgia. Like, watching these guys, watching guys come back from, from you know, their quote unquote demons of the past and and come back and, and put on great matches, uh like Jimmy Rave down in Georgia and stuff, his series of matches against guys like Cedric Alexander and, and JT Dunn and stuff and Chip Day. Uh that's what makes me excited about being a pro wrestler. Watching uh young guys like Timothy Bumpers and uh, or aka Timmy Lou Retton, uh and Darius Lockhart, watch these guys uh come into their own and stuff and, and really start making a uh Start making a name for themselves in the Indies and stuff like that's really getting me excited to to not only watch wrestling but to be a part of wrestling right now. Excellent. What about you, uh, Mr. Drew Skills? Uh, I, I agree a lot with what Will said. The fact that uh, I, I don't want to say a resurgence, but it's definitely trending uh, that direction. Um, you know, there's more places for people to work and, and make a living at. Uh, you know, even if it's, even if it's a part-time living, it's better than what it was a few, uh, you know, just a couple, three, four years ago. So, you know, the fact that that's getting better and, and the big thing, uh, is the fact yeah. that whether or not they know they're doing it or not, uh, the fact that WWE is actually helping with that. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times they do their own thing and they, uh, you know, they, they don't acknowledge any of the other wrestling, uh, going on in the world. And the fact that they are and the things that they're doing with NXT, Regardless if they're trying to help, you know, the, the, the whole wrestling as a whole, or they're not trying to help, it is helping. So I think that's exciting as well. All right, Q, what, what is, what makes you excited about pro wrestling right, uh, right this minute? Three letters, NXT. You know, to me, it's amazing that WWE offers a product called sports entertainment and NXT offers a product called professional wrestling. And I think it's fantastic. And you know, what it's doing is, it's given legs in life to a lot of the bigger indies. Because if you truly look at NXT, they are wrestling there. And that's one of the things that I think the business has needed. It needed somebody at the top to quit doing sports entertainment and start doing pro wrestling so that people would fall back in love with pro wrestling. And I think NXT does it on a big scale. And I think these other independents like Will and Drew talked about, you get Omega, you get Cassidy Riley's group, you get... Uh, you know, Wildcat, Luke Hawks group down there and, and Louisiana. And you get some groups that are just doing incredible things and drawing phenomenal numbers. And how can you not be excited about the future of the business in 2015 with all this happening? Yeah. And, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, NXT is great for developing talents that are already in the uh, pro wrestling industry um, also, you know, taking some of those big football players, that sort of thing, and trying to convert them over into pro wrestling. You know, what what do uh, places like your training facility 
how do you, how do you get people ready to to go on to that next level? Well, you know, for, for me, it's about training uh, the basic fundamentals of professional wrestling. I don't teach anything fancy. I don't even tighten the ropes. So, guys been in the ring for two months and can wrestle in the middle. I don't want them hitting the ropes, hitting the corners because anybody can do that. That's an excuse for not knowing what to do next if you're wrestling in the middle, in my opinion. So I teach my guys to spend the first two months of their career wrestling in the middle, not needing the turnbuckles, not needing the ropes, and then slowly we phase those into it just a tiny bit. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's the thing is you need to teach people how to wrestle. If you teach wrestlers how to wrestle, wrestling is going to get back over. And if you teach them to be sports entertainers, wrestling is never going to get over again. So I teach a very fundamental uh, training regime, keep them in the middle, wrestle a match, get over with your wrestling, and, uh, you know, don't use any excuses to hit ropes or corners because you've lo- you're lost and you don't know what to do next. Well, and you mentioned the uh, Buddy Landell Memorial Cup that you're putting together. This will be the first uh, event, um, happened since uh, Playboy, or excuse me, Nature Boy Buddy Landell passed earlier this year. Uh, you're bringing in Tracy Smothers, who we absolutely love on this show, um, for to do a training seminar. You know what? What can uh, guys that aren't training with you but want to attend this seminar? What can they learn from a, from a one day event with uh, uh, geniuses in the business like you and Tracy Smothers uh, to to get them from you know the point that they're at now to the next level? Well, you know that's the problem with most wrestlers is they don't have a a given path or a road to success in wrestling. So they wander aimlessly about doing show after show, thinking if I do this one and this one, the draws 80 or 100, I'm going to get over and I'm going to get spotted by the WWE. And that's not reality. So what Tracy's going to train people to do, number one is to establish a story in the match. Use intelligent psychology. The first thing you do has to lead to the next thing you do has to lead to the last thing that you do has to lead to the finish. And that's what he teaches. He's also going to teach guys how to get booked in Japan because he spent tons of time there. What I'm going to teach him is how to make money, management, and become wealthy. (laughs) So (laughs) it's it's not much of a trade-off there. How you can get into the stock market, and today I I, I doubled two and a half times my money on one stock. So, you know, I can teach him how to do that. Tracy can teach him how to do the other stuff. I've been fortunate. I've never needed to make money in wrestling business to be successful. I've had a humongous successful outside career. So I'm the unique guy that can tell you how, you know, if you make money, what you can do with it and how you can protect yourself and, and, you know, things like that, tax shelters, stuff like that. So, but Tracy just offers a wealth of experience. I mean, the guy has trained for WWE. He's been in WCW. He's been in the NWA. He's been in WWE. He's been in WWF. He's been to Japan. He's, he's trained tons of guys. He's just, you know, he's he, him and Buddy and I were, were three best friends. That's the way I can describe it because the day that Buddy died, Tracy heard about it before I did. Tracy called me and asked me if I was working. I said, no. He goes, are you sitting down? I said, yes. And he told me, you know, and, and we cried together on the phone for an hour. And it's just him and me and Buddy were just tremendous friends. And when I decided to do this memorial tournament, the first thing I did is call Tracy and say, I want to do it when you can make it. And he's, he, you know, the amazing thing is, uh, Buddy had custody of his grandson, Ethan, and, uh, Buddy's daughter, the mother of Ethan, had passed away in April of this year after a lengthy illness. And Buddy was the, the sole support of Ethan, and he's gone now. He died June 22nd. She died in April. So the first thing that I thought is, how can I provide this young man emotional support? Well, I'm not sure if I can, but I can certainly provide him financial support. And that's where the Buddy Landell Memorial Cup, the inaugural one this year, and we hope it's going to be an annual event here and get bigger and bigger each year. And hopefully within the next seven to eight years, we'll be able to bank enough money for Ethan so that he can go to any college that he decides to go to and not have to worry about the finances and the money to do it. And, you know, if you know Buddy Landell, if you've ever worked a show with him, if you're ever a green guy to talk to him, Buddy never refused helping anybody. He was out there trying to better the business in each one of us and, you know, he, uh, he really gave himself to this business. He, he gave everything he had to us. And, you know, him and I had been best friends for 20 years. We talked every week. And, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's hard. The sense of loss that I, I have since Buddy passed away, 
is a greater sense of loss that I had with either of my parents that passed away because you expect to bury your, your parents, but you don't really expect to bury a contemporary. And that's what he was. And, you know, so it's been, it's been a difficult road for both Tracy Smothers and I. We talk, we text, we support each other. Buddy Landell's mom and I, uh, Buddy Landell's mom, Pat and I talk every week and she's coming in for the event and, you know, if you knew Buddy at all, if you worked the show with him all, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He lit up the room. He was electric. He helped everybody. He made everything better. So, you know, the least that I can do is spend the rest of my life honoring my best friend and try to establish a college fund that supports uh, someone near and dear to his heart, grandson Ethan. Well, thank you so much. And obviously, uh, between now and November 14th, we're going to be talking a lot more about the uh, Buddy Landell Memorial Cup and, and really looking forward to that event. Um, and do you have any, before our guests come on here in a few months, do you have any uh, events coming up this week? I don't have anything this week, but my shameless plug is the Evolution Wrestling Academy, which is owned by yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> it trained you in the great sport of professional wrestling, whether you want to be a manager, valet, referee, it doesn't matter. Uh, we have a show number 14th, but here's the big news. I have three weeks in a row where I'm going to make appearances, which is rare for me. November 14th, the Buddy Landell Memorial Cup at the Buellville National Guard Armory. We have the 21st for Omega Lives at Smithfield, which is a tremendous show every year. It seats about a 1,000. We sell out. Last year, we turned over 300 away at the door. So get your tickets early. Jeff Hardy's making an appearance. Shane Helms will be there. Matt Hardy will be there. C.W. Anderson will be there. And, of course, Q-Ball Carmichael, to represent Carmichael Consolidations, will be there. The following week, another huge week, we have WrestleCade, the annual event that draws over 3,000 fans. And it's run by my friend Tracy Myers and Brian Hawks in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I'm going to be at that one, too. And I couldn't be more excited about these three weeks of professional wrestling in November um, than I am. It's just going to be an amazing period of time in pro wrestling in, in North Carolina. All right. Uh, let's kick it over to the Indianapolis man, the Heroes and Legends heavyweight champion. How many days in a row now, Drew? 1,027 days, my brother. Okay. Wow. We, we've, we've passed the thousand mark. Wow. Uh, what, what do you got coming up this week? Well, this week I will be in Nat Town in the Circle City for WCWO. Uh, I'm taking on uh, TJ Kemp in a uh, Falls Count Anywhere match. And then uh, the week after that, I'll be uh, still here in the Circle City for uh, Circle City Wrestling, NWA Circle City Wrestling, where I'm taking on the Man Beast, the War Machine Rhino. Me and him are going one-on-one on on, uh, that date. Uh, And then the following week, uh, I believe that's what, October, uh, 17th? Is that right? I'm going on the Midwest Monster Tour, baby. I got Circle City Wrestling. The next week I'm going to Proving Ground. Uh, oh no, no, the next week I'll be in Ohio, Lima, Ohio, to defend our War Tag Team Champions, the Soul Shooters, myself and Apollo Star. Uh, so I'll be there on the 10th. Then the 17th we're going out to Proving Ground Pro Wrestling, uh, in Havana, Illinois where we'll be taking on Team IOU uh, for their tag team titles out there. Uh, and then I'll be uh, back in Freetown, Indiana, on the 18th. I'll be deb- debuting for Phoenix Pro Wrestling, uh, where I'm taking on Lightning Bolt Johnson. Uh, me and Lightning Bolt, he stole a victory on me uh, just a few months ago while I was beating up Scott Steiner. Uh, he stole a victory from me, so I got some uh, retribution to pay there. And then... Uh, I'll be going from there. What else do I got? Uh, I'm not exactly sure off the top of my head, but I'm going to be Ohio, Illinois, Indiana on the Midwest Monster Tour for the month of October. Now, Drew, awesome. did you have a chance to watch the Colts game uh, last night? I'm not a Colts fan, but the Colts suck. Go Bears. Bear down. Okay, well, you know, I was thinking about you because I know you're taking on Rhino soon, and uh, yeah. the Colts now have uh, Frank Gore. And he had a had a pretty good game last night. So every time they yelled out Gore, I was thinking about you taking on Rhino. So I, I, I'm I'm a little scared for you, brother. Don't be scared, man. I'm I'm ready. You know I've been saying it for a while, and then Will Huckabee, he's gonna he's gonna I'm sure have something to say about it. But NWA, man, I'm coming for the uh, world heavyweight title, man. Me and Rob Conway, 
Hey, the last the last time we fought, he flipped the victory on on me with a roll up. Uh, you know, but we're going back to war. I'm going through Rhino. Rob Conway just had a world title match. Rhino's my my gateway. Rhino, then Conway, then it's my turn next, right? Where's uh, Godzilla? He's going to be on the show soon. We're, we're going to talk about it. Let's get it. That's right. That's right. Morning Star Will Huckabee, the, the NWA Continental Champion. What do you got going on this week? Well, you know, before I even talk about my schedule or whatever, uh, you know, let me go ahead and say that I'm really proud and I'm really glad that Drew Skills is a part of the NWA uh, because I said time and time again that the best professional wrestlers in the world um, are part of the NWA. Uh, fortunately for Drew, the best wrestlers in the NWA all come from North Carolina. Um, <laughs> but uh, actually, this week I, I have a huge see the NWA. I have a huge, huge match this Thursday um, at a Premier Wrestling Federation down there in Hubert, North Carolina. Um, I'm actually taking on former NWA World Champion uh, Steve Carino, Mr. Wrestling Steve Carino, in the uh, first round of the Hashimoto Legacy Cup. Um, for a lot of people who know about Steve Carino and stuff, uh, Mr. Hashimoto helped God and mold his wrestling career and stuff. And so uh, this is his way of paying homage uh, to, to to Hashimoto and everything and stuff. So I'm very honored to be able to beat up, you know, the king himself, Steve Carino, in the first round this Wednesday. I mean, I'm sorry, this Thursday, uh, where I also, also will be defending my NWA Cottonell title. Uh, so hopefully, you know, I'll be able to say that I, I'll be a former NWA world champion. Uh, and then coming up, I think this weekend, that's about the only thing I have this week. Next week, you know, I'm so busy. I have, uh, what, Friday, I'm in Tennessee, um, for Great American Wrestling. And then I'm traveling all the way back to North Carolina Saturday for NWA Rage on October 3rd. And then on the 4th, I'm down in Atlanta, Georgia for, uh, AWE Atlanta Wrestling entertainment and stuff where me and my buddy Joe Black plan on putting the boots to somebody to some unfortunate tag team once again on our quest to get our hands on Team IOU. So by the time Drew gets to him there might not be much left of those two guys and stuff. Uh but other than that, you know, <clears throat> traveling up and down Tennessee, um, Maryland, hopefully we'll be going back to Boston. Unfortunately we gotta travel through that traffic again. Atlanta, uh hitting Texas up the first weekend in November. Puerto Rico uh, is coming up. We're going to Puerto Rico the second or third weekend of November. I can't remember. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty busy. And like I'm, I'm closing out this year with a bang, Zane. <laughs> hey, Will. Hey, Will. Yes. Yes. Guess who's going to be at Carino's on Thursday night? Are you going to be there? None other than me. Uh, well, then you get to watch me beat up on Steve Carino. It's unfortunate. I was supposed to face his son Kobe uh, September 5th in Wilmington mm. and stuff. Um, for Rodney, for Rodney Mack or Rodney Morris or something like that, and the show got canceled. Uh, so you know, I get to skip the sun and just go ahead and beat up on the dad and stuff. Well, I'm going to be at the WCWO Outlaw Arena on Friday doing a, a little ring announcing, and I'm not sure if Drew Skills will be a heel or a face to me that night. So uh, we'll have to wait and see then. Uh, but uh, definitely come out and catch the action. Q, I'm going to kick it over to you because I believe that we have one of our guests call, has called in. Awesome. Hello, caller. Jeff. Hello? 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 Who do I have? This is uh, Chief Atacula Kula. Hey, Chief. How are you? I'm doing good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Chief, can you give us a little background for those of the listeners that are not familiar? Uh, how you got in the business, what interested you, who you trained with, how you got started? I uh, got in the business in 1986 um, down in Central States. Uh, Irish Terry Gunn used to work for Bob Geigel in Central States promotion down there. I did my initial training. Then I went out to Arizona from there and trained with Dale Pierce and uh, came back and did a little little uh, finishing up with Ox Baker um, back here in the Midwest. Awesome. Awesome. Now, so you've been out there since late 80s, 86, 87? Yeah, 80, 86. I started training in 85. I had my first match in 86. Gotcha. Now, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you you were the AIWF World Heavyweight Champion at one time, weren't you? 
Yeah, um, about three years ago, I think, three or four years ago. Uh, tell us a little bit about that reign and where you wrestled and the, the type of caliber of talent that you wrestled against. Oh, I wrestled, uh, oh, I can't remember how many affiliates the AIWF mm-hmm. had at that time, but I think I wrestled in in about uh, 35 or 40 of them. Uh, at that time, I think they had... Uh, I think they had around a hundred at that time. I think they're, I think they've scaled down a little bit now, but, uh, back then they had a lot of affiliates. Uh, they had, they had good promotions, you know, and some were bad. They had, you know, they, they, they had, a, I think they're a little more selective now, but they had all kinds of, a uh, little bit of everything across the country involved in. So I wrestled, I wrestled, uh, and I think <coughs> 20, 25 states for them. At that point in time, and then uh, they didn't have an affiliate in Puerto Rico, but I, I, I went down, I took the title down to Puerto Rico too because I wrestled. Down. I actually just got back from there last late last night because I wrestled down there extensively. But uh, so I took their title down there during the time that I had it too. I do remember the fact that you took it down there, and you know I think during that time, to be fair to you, there were some promotions that that really should have been in AIWF and may have been sort of uh, I'm going to say it backyard type leagues. And I, right. I know, I know, Chief, that you took some heat back then for being in matches with the guys and not carrying them. But you know what? It's impossible to carry a guy who has never been trained. Am I right? Exactly. I mean, there were some, there were there were some places I went that you know, um, a lot that that, that the promoter, well, you know, that actually owned it was a wrestler too, and he wasn't actually trained. <laughs> and there were several instances where I. So he put himself in the match with me, and it's um, and I guess you know I'm not uh, you know they always said Ric Flair could ruffle a broomstick and make it look good, but I'm not Ric Flair, so I can't I can't do that with uh, just <laughs> anybody that's in the ring with me. But you know I think uh, you know when I've been there with people that can you know carry their half of the match, I can I can uh, entertain people and put on a decent match most of the time. Well, I think you've had a, had a good enough career over the past 25 years where you proved that to people, and I thought as one guy. I thought it was unnecessary that you took some of the heat you did because I looked at where you're wrestling and the type of guys that you're wrestling. Like you said, you know, you get a promoter who's not trained. He's got a few bucks. He gets a ring. He runs a show. He becomes an affiliate. You're the heavyweight champion. Your obligation is to go there and defend the title. And, you know, the old saying, you can't polish a turd is 100% correct. All right. And I, I, I uh, and, and at that point in time, too, um, we, they actually – I was gonna, I, I won the title in October of, uh, what year was that? Was it 2011, I think? And I was actually supposed to win the title in May, and then I, I, I had that major, a week before I was supposed to, uh, win the title, I had the major knee injury. Right. And, uh, blew off my knee, so I was actually supposed to be out for quite a while, and I only stayed out about, uh, I think six or eight weeks, and, and I, and I came back way too soon. So at that point in time, um, uh, leading right leading up to when I did get the title and, and right when I won it, I was not really – I shouldn't probably have been in the ring and def- definitely not in that position at that time because of the injury. And then on top of that, you know, I had to carry some people that I that I couldn't have done even healthy. But but I, I did the best I could with it. And, and at the point leading, leading up to winning the title, I mean, the buildup was good. And then they actually – Enhanced me and enhanced the AWF quite a bit. I know during the time when I when I came in, because I was a good self promoter, and I think that's why they they brought me in because they I actually didn't know much about the AWF when they contacted me and and told me they had this. Uh, I was working for a few couple of the affiliates, but they said they had this uh, storyline they wanted to run by me with the title, and then and um, so I agreed to do it. But um, at the time, I think they had. 1500 they've been around you know a long time and i think they had 14 or 1500 likes on their facebook page and i came in and and, and uh and you know like i said you know i'm a huge self-promoter especially in that period and and, and that's what they like and we we shot their facebook likes up to like 5000 in just a matter of months but uh we had to kind of build up with me and jimmy love that never actually happened because then jimmy dropped the title lewis moore and that's who i ended up winning from uh, the title from was more was an excellent, uh, uh, great talent. I works the crowd great. He's a great in ring worker. Uh, it, it was it was uh, a pleasure to work with Lewis Moore. Now was that here in North Carolina where you where you uh, beat Lewis Moore for the title? No, I won the title in uh, actually in Virginia. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, now it's been, I guess maybe, how long did you have the title for, Chief? Two years? No, no. I, I had it, uh, I think a little under a year. Oh, okay. I thought it was a bit longer run. Well, let me ask you a question. How was Chief, and, and I don't want to butcher this. I think I got it right. At the Kula Kula, how was Chief born? I mean, from the person that you are, how was that persona and that character born? Because I find it interesting and unique, and I want to know what the impetus behind that was. Well, I'm a, a quarter Cherokee. My grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee, so I wanted to do a Native American gimmick when I got into the business, but I'd always been a fan of the heels when I was growing up, so I wanted to be a heel. Right. And when I first got when I first got into it, um, you know, I told Terry and a few other people that were training me I want to be a heel, and they're like, "Well, Indians are not heels in wrestling," and I said, "Well, I want to, I want to be a heel Indian." So that's that's why I went with the pink uh, hair, which I have today. I, I think the first month or two I wrestled, I when, I when I had my first match, I had a black mohawk. I had my regular hair then, and about two months in, I I switched to the pink, and I've had it ever since. And so I went with a pink, which got a lot of heat back in those days. And then uh, Chief, I did some research. Of course, we didn't have the internet back then, so I had to do it in libraries and stuff. <laughs> but uh, Chief Atacula Kula was actually a uh, legitimate chief back in the Revolutionary War period. And he actually uh, was a traitor. He sold information to the colonists, and he sold information to the British. So he was playing both sides. Gotcha. Very, very, very interesting and unique. And, and the fact that you wanted to work it as a heel and, of course, from a guy who wore a pink singlet with a rose across the crotch, uh, I think we all know that a big guy in pink is almost an instant heat getter. <laughs> Which yeah, is back a good, in the day, it was, yeah, was, but not so not so much now. Now, well, uh, you know, I, I was a, I was a heel for twenty three straight years, and then a few years ago, uh, a couple of companies wanted to use me as a face, and it actually gets over the face now, so I can work either or. Uh, but for twenty three straight years, I was nothing but a heel. Well, you know, I've been around a long time too, and you know as well as I do. And those drill skills, there's no real heat anymore, anyway. Heat, heat's a thing of the past. And, you know, I, I wish it was. I wish it was there, but I, I think half the problem with not getting any heat is people don't know how to sell anymore. What's your take on that? Well, I think it's still, it's still possible. I mean, the business is so much exposed now. But I, I put up a video today from. From Puerto Rico, of course, that's a different uh, world than we have here. It's a different world, down yeah, there, brother. Yeah, yeah, and, you, and if you watch the video I just put up this afternoon, it's I mean, and the, the, you can get tons of heat down there. I mean, it's it's actually dangerous to an yeah. extent because those people get so passionate. But well, I course. actually um, a, a few about uh, three or four weeks ago, Tiny and I, the night we won the tag team belts, we actually uh, a fan in the crowd actually pulled a gun on us, and uh, security oh. had to. Uh, take care of that situation. So there, but of course I was in Detroit too. So, <laughs> wow. but yeah, there's, there, there's still pockets out there and down South. Uh, I, I used to wrestle in Tennessee and Georgia a lot. And then up in uh, Dunlap, Tennessee, which is a, a small mountain town. I, I don't know if you've been there, but, um, it's a very small town, but those fans remind me of the uh, Puerto Rican fans when I used to wrestle down there because the, the fans up in that town very much believed it and, and, uh, still were very passionate about it. But, so there, there are still areas, but I think the problem these days, in my opinion, like I notice a lot of guys, like I am a, a more of a character, you know, uh, with my gimmick and everything, and I'm kind of large, old school brawler. I'm not this great technician, but I think what, what I see are a lot of guys, young guys in the business now, really want to do a lot of technical wrestling, which which isn't a problem, but when they're a heel. I see a lot of guys, they'll walk out to the ring and be arrogant and get a little heat from the crowd then, but then they get in the ring and the bell rings and they just wrestle. Yep. And, you know, they, yep. they're, they're not a heel. They, they, they forget the crowd there once they're in the ring. You still got to constantly, you know, I get someone in a corner, get their face in the corner, give them a big chop. My turn and look at the crowd and I sell it to them too and get a little heat from it, you know, and then go back. You know, I think guys go too fast in my opinion and, and I think they ignore the crowd. And I, a lot of times I'll see a match. And and a guy who's a heel wants to do a lot of this technical stuff, and he actually gets in there and out wrestles the face, which you know is not it's not going to get you any heat. I mean, yeah. You're you know what you're exactly right, and that's that's the nice thing about talking to, to an old school veteran too is you understand that you know uh, for instance the, you spent most of your career as a heel as I did, and my my heel heat was punching when the ref isn't looking, but everybody else is choking when the ref isn't looking, but everybody else is. 
and just, you know, being a nasty guy. No, there was no, there was no Russian leg sweeps. There was no fisherman suplexes. There, there were no superplexes. I just went in there and got nasty, dirty, cheap heat, and it worked phenomenal. But when these guys come in, like you said, and it's a great point, Chief, these guys come in and they want to out-wrestle the face, and then what happens is the people don't want to side with the face because he's not the best wrestler. But they don't want to side with the heel because he's the heel, so they check out. Instead of getting them to emotionally invest in the match and the characters, they're checked out. Exactly. And, and, and I actually, you know, I still wrestle very old school, and, and it can still get over. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, I don't know if you would know Outlaw Dave Bell um, from the Minnesota area. He's a veteran and does a cowboy yep. gimmick, but we had a match, and it's one of his favorite matches, and he said it was one of the most simple matches he's done, but it was at a cancer show in Wisconsin uh, uh, two years ago, and, and uh, most of the match, I worked the old bear hug spot on him, you know, oh, and he beautiful. was trying to get out of it. And the crowd, I mean, the video was out there on the internet, but the crowd never shut up. We were out there for 20 minutes. I and mean, when we did a lot of other stuff, but I mean, it, it all centered around the bear hug spot. And, and, uh, I kept working his back and the crowd, the crowd just never shut up the whole time. And he said, you know, he's had a lot of bigger technical matches, but he said to this day, that's probably his favorite match he's ever had because he said the crowd was just so nuts. And he goes, we, we really did nothing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But you know, I mean, that, that's <clears throat> psychology, you know. Sure. And, you know, for me, Chief, and I'm sure it's the same with you, and I know it's the same with Drew Skills, is the art of professional wrestling was getting the most reaction by doing the least amount of things in the ring. And that's what protected us and allowed us to have 20 or 25 year careers, is we weren't out there doing crazy spots and killing ourselves. And by the third one, it doesn't mean anything anyway. So, you know, to be able to go out there and work a hold, like the bear hug hold, and get the crowd eating out of the palm of your hand is just a tremendous feeling, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is, and it's like yeah, I wouldn't if I did uh, half the stuff I see guys doing these days. You know, I'm I'm 49 years old, and I'll be 50 in March. I wouldn't still be doing this, you know. And I and I've even had you know I've blown out both my knees and separated my shoulder. I've had several injuries over the years, but I mean, you know, I'd have probably been done at 35 or 40, you know, if I was doing half the stuff they do nowadays. Absolutely. Well, well, do us a favor, Chief, and tell us what's next on the menu for you or the agenda for you. What's your what's your main focus right now in the sport of professional wrestling? Well, I'm, I'm going to keep traveling and doing what I'm doing. I got uh, next year. I'm, we're actually working on buying a, a second home in Puerto Rico because I'm going to be spending even more time in Puerto Rico next year. Um, I, 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 my career is kind of uh, a, a chunk of it's uh, moved down there now, so I probably net, you know next year half of my time will be spent down there. But I'm still I go off to the Northwest. I go over to Detroit. Um, I I go up to Minnesota, Wisconsin, Chicago. Um, I don't get down south quite as much as I, I I still I was down in Trenton, Tennessee a couple weeks ago. I'll be back down there in January, January second. But um, right now I'm focusing on defending the tag titles, the UIWA tag titles I have with Tiny and uh, our our tag team. Uh, it's been working out well. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I'll probably continue the tag teaming up here because I think at this point in my career, my age, it's probably probably good to have a tag team partner, maybe to split some <laughs> of the chores with. And then when I go down to Puerto Rico, um, mostly I, I work as a single a lot, so um, I kind of have a singles career down there, maybe, and kind of kind of I, I plan on tagging up here a lot in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, tell tell me what it's like working in Detroit because you know as well as I do. The, with the Cobo Hall and the Sheik, it's a very storied town that has a deep wrestling history. How is it to actually, in, in 2015 or 14 or the last two or three years, how is it to work in Detroit? What part of Detroit are you working in, and how are you received by the fans? Um, it's, it's kind of uh, interesting over there because I've been, I've been a, 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 a I, I, when I first went over there, was a face. A few years ago, and and then they turned to me heel, and then I had a slight kind of swerve face turn back, and I'm I'm back heel now. But it, it's a, it's an interesting demographic. I work in a, a different suburbs around uh, Detroit, and actually in Detroit itself too, uh, but um, uh, out in Garden City and um, a couple other places. But yeah, um, it's kind of interesting. Even even um, as a heel over there, I get kind of a mixed reaction. Right. Um, 
it, it's almost like the John Cena thing in the reverse, though, because I'm supposed to be a heel, but there's a, there's a portion of the crowd that cheers me over there. Uh, there's a lot of heel fans over in the Detroit area. And, and, and so it, it's kind of, it's kind of a mixed reaction. Understand. Tell me about the, the, the totem pole of love and your, your partner, Tiny, and how that came about and why you guys decided to do it and why it seems to be so popular. Well, Tiny and I had, had feuded uh, over in uh, Wisconsin. I was heel and he was a face. And then, then he turned heel and he was, start, it started to work over in Detroit a little bit too. And he was a heel over there and, and, and so was I. And then, uh, uh, and we just, I just thought that the team, you know, cause I, I've always, whenever, whenever I've been on a team, I've been on teams off and on over the years, but I've always been the big guy in it. I, you know, I weigh 335 and I'm six foot one, but he's six foot six and 480. So, um, I thought, you know, you don't really see, because, you know, indie wrestling is eBay too. There's so many guys that are small. You know, I mean, a 200, 225 pound guy almost is a large guy these days. And back when I got into business, um, even though I'm like 335 now, I remember when I was going to get into business when I was, when I was 18, 19 years old, I want to get into it. I was like 190. And I talked to Bob Geigel because I used to help set the ring in Des Moines, Iowa here and stuff. And I, and, uh, and, uh, he's like, well, you need to, you need to put on some weight. And he said, I, I couldn't even look at, you know, doing anything with you until, you know, training you until you're up like 220, 225, you know, at a minimum. Yeah. Cause, yeah. you know, that's, that's how it was back then. That was a small guy back then, you know. You know, it's funny but that you mentioned a- that. I was given a lead in tonight to me. And, you know, at, I moved from upstate New York to Hawaii to get trained. And I went to Lars Anderson school. I was 6'1", 6'2", 225. He looked at me and said, you're too small. <laughs> yep. Exactly. It was a whole different yeah, world I, I worked, back then. I worked with Lars years ago. Um, what, what year did you uh, work with him or start with him? Well, I didn't. He actually turned me down, and I ended up going to Peter Maivia's Palama Settlement Gym and training with Steve Offy. Okay. Yeah, cause I, 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 uh, worked, uh, for, for Leah Maivia, um, a few times in 88, 89 down there towards the end when, you know, things weren't quite going as well down there, but I worked down there with her and Lars and, uh, Farmer Boy Ipo and, uh. Yeah, and, Farmer uh, Boy Ipo was a big boy. He trained with us. He was no joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, a, I had a little, a little small feud with him down there in 88, I think 88 oh, nice. or 89. Nice. Did you know, yeah. uh, did you know Ernie Bruiser, even Ernie Stevens, or a Diamond Fanini, or any of the other Simones there? Um, I knew, I knew um, when I, when I was down there, um, Steve Offy, who you who you trained with, he was there, and then um, um, Billy White Wolf, who was she had in NLK, right, uh, in, right, in AWA, um, uh, he was down there, he was down there working down there when I was down and, there, and so he I was think, doing the he was doing the Billy White Wolf thing there, right, and then of course right. he was still doing Sheik up in AWA. Sure, and Ripper Collins was there, right? Yeah. Remember Ripper? Yeah. And yeah, uh, I, I mean, a great day. I left. I left there in '86, so I left right before you went aboard. But you know, Bruce Hart and I have talked about him going down there about that time or shortly thereafter, being stranded in a banana forest waiting for a ticket home. <laughs> yeah, I, I went down there three different times, and uh, for a couple weeks at a time, and we were they were doing it the uh, TV tapings at Hickman Air Force Base. And, right. Yeah, when I was down there, I don't know if that, that's what they were doing when you were down there, but that's what they were doing when I was down there. That was the the main venue, anyway. Well, I was, for, I was uh, oh, that, back to what we were saying about the team. Uh, I thought there's no large, really big teams these days, you know. So right. I, you know, and we had feuded, and then, you know, like I said, then he turned heel, and I'm like, you know, now that we're both heel, maybe we should just team up because this would be like a monster team, and. uh and it's been kind of fun because I actually, you know, I'm not the speediest guy in the world, but I'm actually the small, speedy guy on the team. <laughs> well, um, I've seen you in the ring. Way. You're actually you're actually very mobile for a man your size, dude. I'll give you credit. You move around really good oh. in that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, well, let me ask you a question. You're based out of where now? Uh, Iowa? Yeah, out of Iowa. I live in Iowa City, Iowa. Beautiful, beautiful. And Tiny Love's out of the same area? Uh, Tiny's out of uh, Milwaukee. I got you. I got you. So if people want to book you or book you in Tiny, where can they reach you at, Chief? Um, well, a lot of, most people uh, either get a hold of me. Uh, I am on Twitter at, at the Chief Ada, and then uh, on uh, Facebook. And a lot of a lot of uh, promoters actually contact me through my Facebook page. 
Yeah. Um, I have my regular one, Rod, at the Kula Kula page. And then I have a fan page that's, you know, she found a Kula Kula fan page. So I can be contacted at uh, any of those three places. Beautiful, beautiful. Now let's, let's, it's time for a shameless plug, Chief. Do you have anything coming up in the immediate future that you'd like to push a little bit? Oh, yeah, there's, um, lots of stuff. Uh, this week actually being my last week off for the year, I think, and last weekend off, this one coming up because I just got back from Puerto Rico, so I got this weekend open, and then I got, I think, uh, Wisconsin and Detroit again. Um, I'll be going back out to uh, Seattle, uh, I think, in in, uh, in about three weeks, three or four weeks. Um, I got Tennessee, big big show, um, uh, big rematch. Uh, and Chief, how are the crowds uh, in Seattle these days? Oh well, where where I, where I wrestle up there for SCW is actually in Bremerton because the, the athletic commission is so tight. Uh, in Washington, they have a very strict athletic commission, so. Uh, SCW runs in Bremerton. Well, gotcha. they're out of Bremerton, but they run it the, on these uh, Suquamish gotcha. uh, Indian reservations, so they don't have to follow the athletic commissioner rules. So on, uh, they do they do well on the uh, on the uh, uh, reservation, you know. And and um, actually, Kevin Sullivan uh, is, is part of that group out there. Kevin helps with that. He lives out there now, and you know, Kevin looked for Florida and for WCW and. So, so we get to work with Kevin Sullivan out there, and and uh, they do they do well on the reservation. Um, and uh, I wrestle down in Oregon too. Oregon is is kind of a mixed bag anymore. Uh, there's there's uh, several companies running in Oregon, and some of them do well, and some of them don't. And there are some there are a few really bad backyardish companies, so that kind of hurts hurts things in Oregon a little bit. But, sure, but. Um, sure. But there's really not that many people running in the state of Washington itself. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm a sucker for these old school areas that had a territory at one time, like the Pacific Northwest and Detroit and Chicago. And, you know, for me, it's, it's days gone by, but, you know, I, I always have a sort of a, sort of a, a, a sweet spot in my heart for those places. Zane, do you have any questions or Drew skills for uh, Chief before he goes? Well, I just, uh, I just had a quick one. Uh, you'd mentioned, uh, Pacific Northwest and the territories up there. Uh, are you familiar with, uh, NWA Blue Collar? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, uh, I wrestled for, um, uh, Blue Collar Wrestling for, you know, what, off and on for three years when they were part of the UIWA. Very nice. I've, I've got a, a good friend, uh, sign guy who's a, uh, referee out there. So I always like to give yeah. them, uh, give them a shot. Yeah, are, are yeah. Fine, guy? fine guy is a very good friend of mine, actually, and um, and uh, he he also referees for SCW in Washington. He fine guy works for just about everybody out there. Well, he's he's a he's a cool guy, and uh, give a shout out to him. He does a lot of different podcasts on the Turnbuckle Turmoil Network. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so give a big shout out to him, um, Drew and Will. Uh, who wants to go first uh, with Chief Atacula Kula? I just want to uh, tell you, man, we appreciate you coming on, bro. It was uh, good to hear your story tonight. Yeah, I, I appreciate you all having me on here. It's been, I think, it's been a couple of years since I've been on the show, actually. So, yeah, uh, you were you were one of our early guests, uh, so uh, very nice to have you back on. Uh, Will Huckabee, do you have any questions for Chief Atacula Kula? No, no, I was going to say the same thing as, as uh, Drew was saying. Say thank you for coming on and being a guest in the show and sharing your not only your story but your experiences and stuff all of, all across the world basically. <laughs> yeah, hey, I, Chief I Atacula Kula, uh you gave a, a quick plug for your uh social media sites, but can you uh tell our listeners those again please? Um on Twitter it's at the Chief Atta. And then I have uh uh well it's not really a personal fan, uh, Facebook page, but I have Rod at the Kula Kula. It used to be Chief at the Kula Kula where you could friend me, but of course Facebook made me change it a while back. <laughs> get rid of the Chief part. It's, and then I, I have police. a Chief. Yeah, and then I had a Chief at the Kula Kula fan page, so um, I can be you know, reached at any of those. Well, well, Chief, I got to tell you, it's Cue Ball Carmichael here, and I was I was really excited to talk to you because in in all the last twenty some years working around these areas. We've never crossed paths, but, uh, 
you know, I, I can tell you that the guys that I talk to that know you have nothing but good things to say about you, which is positive in this business. You're a busy guy. And I want to really thank you for coming on the show tonight. It was good to get to know you a little bit, hear your story and your background. It's good to have another old school brother out there tearing it up. Well, thanks for having me on, and I, I appreciate talking to you all. All right. Well, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Uh, uh, been our first uh, episode with uh, two new hosts, uh, Cue Ball Carmichael and the uh, Heroes and Legends champion, Drew Skills, uh, plus returning, as always, the NWA Continental champion, uh, William Huckabee, the Morning Star. Next week, we've got Mary Elizabeth Monroe, a uh, great woman's wrestler, and, and always fun to have uh, one of the uh, ladies of professional wrestling on the show. And she she's not a diva. She is a wrestler. And uh, the founder of WrestleCrap.com and the author of The Death of WCW, now on its 10-year anniversary pressing, R.D. Reynolds. So it should be a great show next week. Uh, this is Zane Paisley. I'm going to give a quick shout out to, uh, WCWO. I will be, uh, there again on Friday night at the Outlaw Arena in Indianapolis. I'm going to kick it back over to, uh, our host, Q Ball Carmichael. Listen, I just want to say it was great to be out tonight. It was nice to get to know the Chiefs a little bit better. Um, it was great for, I think, the first night of us hosting, having Zane and Drew and I carry most of the conversation between us was a good way for us. Uh, to meld. We thought it was going to work. We proved it worked. And we kind of got a little bit and to know where each person has their strengths and things and asking questions and stuff. And I think it was just a phenomenal first show for all of us, in my opinion. Well, and also, also Will Huckabee coming in at the end, making, Who? making the hot Who? tag for us. Who? 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 <laughs> Hawk! Hawk! <laughs> you know, I love you, brother. You know, hey, I think we ought to. Zane Drew, Zane Drew, it's so funny that Q-Ball says that. But now that he has, you know, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling League going on and stuff, you know, I'm not opposed to uh, traveling a couple hours down the road and, and trying to teach, you know, a uh, more experienced dog. I'm not going to call him old. I'm going to call him more experienced dog a new trick or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, listen, after we get through this Buddy Landau Memorial Cup, our next show, which will be known as unbearable and if you've seen our logo you get it nice. unbearable we'll make sure we get up with you and get your book down here in a match brother it won't be against me because <laughs> as you know i'm seven eights retired <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows it who knows it may be against true skills i just want to say i had a great time tonight guys i think we had a great first show of all of us being together our season premiere i think it went great if you enjoyed the show tonight tell your friends tell everybody the Undisputed Wrestling Show is doing great things. 